the Associate Director of the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to uh, go over how to ask questions in today's event. Um, anytime during the webinar, you can submit your questions um, uh, to the speaker using the Q&A button. Uh, just type your question into that window and we'll get to as many questions as we can during the, the Q&A session after the talk. So the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing uh, is the leading venue for collaborative research in theoretical computer science. It was established in 2012 with a grant from the Simons Foundation. Uh, it brings together the world's leading researchers in theoretical computer science and related fields, uh, as well as the next generation of outstanding young scholars to explore deep unsolved problems about the nature and limits of computation. And as well as promoting fundamental research on the foundations of computer science, the Institute aims to expand the horizons of the field by exploring other scientific disciplines through a computational lens. Today's lecture is part of the Theoretically Speaking series that the Institute hosts, which uh, it's a series that highlights exciting advances in theoretical computer science for a public audience. And when we're not sheltering in place, these talks are held in downtown Berkeley with an audience from the uh, broader Bay Area community. But of course, for now, our world is online only. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished speaker today, uh, Professor Michael Kearns. Michael holds the National Center Chair in the Computer and Information Science Department at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's been a professor since 2002. He has secondary appointments in economics, in statistics, and in operations information and decisions. He's also an external faculty member with the Santa Fe Institute. And since June this year, he's had a role at Amazon as part of its Amazon Scholars Program. Uh, he's worked extensively in quantitative and algorithmic trading on Wall Street. He serves as an advisor to technology companies and venture capital firms. And he's involved in the uh, Seed Stage Fund Founder Collective. Michael is a fellow of the Association for Computing Machinery, the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, the Society for the Advancement of Economic Theory, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And of course, Michael has a strong Berkeley connection. He was an undergrad here at Berkeley and uh, Michael and I met in 1991 when he was a postdoc here at ICSI. Um, his mentor was Dick Karp, the founding director of the Simons Institute. Um, so great to, to have you back, at least in this online fashion, Ma Michael. Um, Michael's talk today is on the ethical algorithm, which is also the title of a book he's written with Aaron Roth. Uh, so very, uh, excited to have you here and looking forward to the talk. Welcome, Michael. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much. Can you see my slides and hear me okay? We can, yep. Okay, great. Um, thanks for the introduction, Peter, and um, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. I saw the names of many old friends and colleagues in the participant list, which is very nice to see. Um, yeah, so Late last year, a book that my good friend and colleague, Aaron Roth at Penn and I wrote came out. And it's called The Ethical Algorithm. And kind of in keeping with this lecture series, this is a, a book about science written for a general lay audience. Um, and so what I wanna do today is just give you a snapshot of kind of the topics in the book. And really this book is meant to be a general audience representation of what I think is a very important trend going on in machine learning um, and algorithms more generally. Um, and so the subtitle is The Science of Socially Aware Algorithm Design. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our motivation in writing this book. So as I'm sure many, many people in this talk um, are aware, uh, in recent years especially, following kind of the great excitement about major advances in AI and machine learning in the first part of this decade, largely around applications in vision and speech and powered by deep learning. Um, there's been a bit of a buzzkill or backlash as we have gradually realized that there are collateral damages that can occur in the deployment of sort of large scale AI and machine learning systems. And there are a number of good general audience books on these topics. Perhaps the most famous of them is Weapons of Math Destruction, which um, kind of on a chapter by chapter basis tells you about real ordinary people who've been harmed in different domains by um, kind of misuses or abuses of machine learning um, in you know, everything from criminal sentencing to consumer lending to college admissions to employment. 
um, algorithms of oppression is about the way bias in society can be perpetuated by search engines and search results, all, you know, again, powered by machine learning and by the collective data that we generate for such systems. Data and Goliath is a great book about um, sort of privacy and security in the commercial surveillance age that we have arrived at. And so um, Aaron and I like all these books. I think that they're important, interesting books. But where we felt they were lacking was when they came to their solutions section. So every one of these books does a very good job of identifying some real problems. And then also usually towards the end has a chapter on you know, solutions. What should we do about all this? And, and I might kind of overcharacterize unfairly, but I think it's not too far off the mark to say that each of these books basically says, well, we need better laws, we need better regulations, we need watchdog groups, you know, we really have to keep an eye on all these problems. And let me just say at the outset that, you know, my co-author and I agree with that entirely. Um, but as people who work in machine learning and algorithm design, um, we know that there is another way also, a perhaps complementary way, which is if we don't like something about the behavior of our algorithms as they stand now, we could think about just changing the algorithm in the first place, okay? Um, so rather than you know just doing things as we normally do them and waiting for harms to occur and then litigating them or regulating them after the fact, we could think about trying to design our algorithms in a different way and prevent those harms or at least mitigate those harms in the first place. And it would have been easy to kind of say that if it were not for the very large amount of research that has taken place in the last 10 years in the machine learning and largely theoretical computer science communities on exactly those topics. So we kind of felt like the time was right to kind of tell a larger world than the community of people that we talk to all the time already about what was going on in that discipline. And you know, just so we're all on the same page here at the beginning, the research agenda that we describe in this book um, seeks to actually you know, precisely define and actually embed social norms or values in algorithms. So literally the idea is if I can be precise enough about what I mean by a concept like privacy or a concept like fairness, um, so precise that I could, you know, write it down mathematically and then impose it as a constraint in my Python code, um, then in principle, we could have algorithms that behave better with respect to the types of problems that the books on my last slide clearly identify. Um, now, depending on exactly what social norm we have in mind, um, you know, this, this can be easier said than done. But um, especially in this lecture series, one point I'd like to make at the outset is that perhaps the most important part of this enterprise is the very first step, which is being exceedingly precise about definitions. And in case you know, nobody knew this already, computer scientists are far from the first community of people to have ever thought carefully about things like fairness, privacy, and the like. Um, I mean, in the case of fairness, it goes back at least to the ancient philosophers and through modern times, you know, recent communities that have thought quite deeply about things like fairness include obviously moral philosophers, legal scholars, economists, and many, many others. But the truth is, is that none of those communities have ever or have ever wanted or needed to be, again, so precise about what they meant by a notion such as fairness that you could literally embed it in your, in your code, okay? And one point that we make early in the book, um, you know, kind of speaking very much from our roots as theoretical computer scientists, is that one of the values of that enterprise is that, you know, sometimes by thinking very, very hard about the right definition or something, um, you, you will uncover flaws in your intuitions about these things that you weren't going to discover any other way. Okay, and I'll give a couple of examples as, as we go along. And again, because this is a, a series about theoretical computer science for a more general audience, uh, I might make the additional remark that, um, you know, there are many areas of computer science where the theory is interesting, but not particularly necessary for the advance of, of the, you know, the empirical side of the discipline. 
So, you know, Peter and I and many others on this call have worked our entire careers on theoretical topics in machine learning. And there's a lot of interesting practical results in that body of theoretical work. But the thing about machine learning is, you know, even if you, even if you don't have a definition of what learning means, um, and even in the presence of intractability results that tell you that the most basic machine learning problems should be hard in the worst case, there's nothing preventing you from getting data and going out and trying it and seeing if it works on your data set. And if it does, you know, if you build a model that has good predictive accuracy, um, you don't really need any theory to tell you why it works or exactly what definition of learning that it means. But when we're talking about actually trying to encode in an algorithm what you mean by something like fairness or privacy, and what promises that that definition is going to give to individuals, um, the stakes are kind of much higher for getting definitions right, okay? Because you know, you're know you gonna go out and do something and it's gonna make choices that might, let's say, favor one group or harm another group. And it's not so easy to just say, well, let's just try it and see what happens. In some sense, that's kind of what got us into this mess in the first place, right? Is kind of people just saying like, well, I'm just gonna run you know, stochastic gradient descent on a deep convolutional neural network on this large consumer data set and you know, what could possibly go wrong? Well, there's a, you know, at least the books on the last slide that I showed you to tell you what could go wrong with that. And so you know, not to go on too long about this, I think that this is an area where because definitions are very important and understanding the consequences of those definitions is very important, the relative um, kind of importance of theory is much, much higher. So, so that, you know, at a high level, so the summary of our book is to survey recent research um, around the topic of ethical algorithms, meaning being precise what you mean by these social values or norms, and then the consequences of implementing those in your algorithms. Um, and the book is roughly arranged, um, at least at the first half of the book, around different social norms. So, you know, there's an early chapter on privacy. There's an early chapter on algorithmic fairness. Um, and I've written a bunch of social norms here that you know, if you traffic in the AI and ML community have become uh, quite topical. Um, and you'll notice that they're written in increasing, you know, in increasingly fading text here. And, and that fading text is meant to represent our subjective view of how scientifically mature each of these areas is at the time that we wrote the book. So for instance, our feeling is that the study of algorithmic privacy and specifically differential privacy is perhaps the most scientifically mature of these areas. Um, fairness we think is maybe a decade behind but off to a solid start. Um, things like interpretability or explainability we think are very important topics but we think that um, we're quite far from being on firm scientific footing there in the sense that, you know, again, in our opinion, um, good, good general definitions of these notions have not yet been given. And if there's time at the end or in the q and I can maybe say a little bit more about why we feel that way. Um, but, but so what I want to do in the rest of the talk is, is just kind of give you a couple of vignettes, um, one around privacy and the other one around fairness. And in each of these vignettes, I'm gonna first of all observe how it's possible to be very, very precise about a definition for what you mean by something like privacy or fairness and to get it entirely wrong, right? So in other words, being precise isn't by itself enough, obviously. It's possible to give very precise, even actionable definitions that are kind of the wrong ones for various reasons. And I'm gonna you know, give examples of that both for privacy and also for fairness. And in each of those cases, you know, that, that will lead to sort of alternative definitions of privacy, fairness, or whatever that seem closer to the right definition or at least a better definition, okay? And, and along the way, I'll try to give kind of case studies and examples of um, both what's known about these topics from a scientific theoretical standpoint and a little bit about where we stand with respect to deployment of these ideas in fielded systems and also kind of how all of these um, scientific topics do or do not play well with the current state of our, our laws and regulations in the US and the EU and elsewhere. So um, let me first talk about data privacy. 
Um, so there's a now famous quote due to Cynthia Dwork, um, uh, which simply goes as, as anonymized data is. And basically this is meant as a critique of the set of techniques, which are, you know, if, if there's one type of privacy notion, which is in the most widespread use and deployment and is most pervasive in our laws, it is based around things like anonymization or, you know, eradicating PII, personally identifiable information. And um, Cynthia's quote is meant to basically say, either you haven't done enough anonymization, and so the data actually isn't anonymized at all, or you've done so much of it that it isn't really data anymore in the sense of it being useful for anything, okay? So what's the idea behind anonymization? Well, the vague idea behind anonymization is I start with some database, let's say like this toy medical database um, on the upper half of this slide. And I decide, well, look, you know, this is valuable data. I'd like to be able to share this data outside of the confines of this hospital, maybe it's the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. I'd like to share it with scientists. I maybe want to pool my data set with other hospitals to get a more, a broader demographic representation, but it's sensitive data. Each row of this database is somebody's actual medical record. So what I'm gonna go in and do is I'm going to, you know, give myself kind of two different operations, redaction and coarsening. So I'm gonna allow myself to go into like the name column and say, you know, um, it's not really important what somebody's name is to, you know, build a predictive model for what their diagnosis is or for a rare disease. So I'm just gonna eradicate that entirely. Um, age might be relevant in disease prediction. Um, but I don't want to put down people's exact age because I might be able to re-identify individual records that way. So I'm going to group that into, you know, um, blocks of 10 years. I'm going to keep gender. I'm going to redact the last two digits of zip code, et cetera. Okay. And, you know, the high level idea behind anonymization is that if I do enough of this, but not too much of it, the database will still be useful for something like, you know, building predictive models for rare diseases but I shouldn't be able to go in and kind of squint at this anonymized database and kind of be able to reconstruct the actual medical record of real people. So in particular, the kind of thing we'd like to avoid is if I have some additional information outside of this anonymized database, like I have a female neighbor, I know her name is Rebecca and that she's 57 years old. I shouldn't be able to go into this database knowing perhaps that she is a patient at this hospital and figure out which medical record is hers. And so indeed, if I look at this database and take what I know about my neighbor, Rebecca, well, her name is missing from the database that's been redacted. And there are two records that match what I know about my neighbor, that she's 57 years old and female. And so, you know, because of this anonymization, I have some confusion about which of these two rows might be my neighbor's um, uh, medical record. I would point out to you that already my, you know, from just narrowing it down to these two records, I know that my neighbor either has HIV or colitis, which she might well consider to be a violation of her privacy already. Um, but we might hope to wish this away by saying, well, in a real database, um, there might be 10,000 such records and I might do enough anonymization and redaction that, you know, for any particular row that I knew something about, there would be at least a hundred other rows that match, not just two rows that match, okay? And in fact, this is one of the formal definitions of anonymity. So the, the definition of k-anonymity means that I do enough redaction and coarsening such that if you go in and, you know, look, look at the rows or a subset of the rows, for instance, that anything that matches, you know, a subset, a, a particular row or a subset of the columns um, there will be at least k other matches in the database. So I will be kind of k confused about which row belongs to my neighbor, Rebecca, okay? Okay, so um, this doesn't seem unreasonable, but there are serious kind of irreparable problems with it, okay? So, so one, one of them is kind of more conceptual, which is I, I've given you like a syntactic definition of fairness. I basically say, you know, you meet anonymity if this property of the database holds. But I haven't really told you as an individual why you should think that that's a satisfying guarantee of privacy, okay? 
So it's entirely syntactic. It's not like a semantic guarantee at all, okay? But, but the problem is actually much worse than that, or the fact that I, I can infer things like my neighbor is either HIV or has colitis. The, the real kind of you know, moral problem with anonymization techniques is that they pretend like the database that you are anonymizing is the only data set that will ever exist now or in perpetuity. And as soon as that kind of threat model is violated, which basically it, you know, is everywhere all the time in the real world these days, um, all bets are off. So in particular, um, at the top, I, I've shown you a two anonymous database. If you project onto the fields of name, age, gender, and zip code, any, if you carefully verified it for any values of those four attributes in the top database, there are at least two rows that match. And the bottom database is similarly three anonymous, okay? But if I take the join of these two databases and what I know about my neighbor, Rebecca, um, then from the top of the database, I know she has either HIV or colitis. From the bottom, I know she has HIV, lupus, or a hip fracture. And from the join, I know unambiguously that she has HIV, okay? So whatever promise I gave you about, say, K-anonymity in the presence of an isolated anonymized database, that, that promise is you know, incredibly brittle in the sense that just joining two databases that both meet the property can eradicate all privacy guarantees whatsoever, okay? So, so this is an example of a precise but broken definition. Again, unfortunately, to the extent that our laws and regulations are ever very precise about what they mean by privacy, they usually mean exactly this kind of broken notion. So HIPAA, which is the body of law governing healthcare in the United States, bakes in notions of anonymity left and right. So, you know, in some ways, this is even worse than not being precise at all because you've committed precisely to something that is broken, okay? And, you know, this is gonna take some time to undo and I think will have to be undone eventually. Okay, so I'm curmudging and complaining about one definition of privacy. So what would be a better definition of privacy? Well, if the problem with the, the notion, things like k anonymity is that they're too weak from a privacy perspective, let me give you another definition that's flawed in the opposite direction, which is that it's too strong. Meaning that if we adopted this notion of privacy, we would essentially not be able to make valuable societal or commercial use of data. So what's the definition of privacy I have in mind? So I could make this precise, but I don't think I need to. Um, imagine I, you know, you have your medical record and I'm asking whether you would be willing to contribute your medical record to some valuable study that I'm hoping to perform, okay? And you have privacy concerns. And suppose I told you, well, look, whatever you're worried about, the chances of that happening to you, um, you, the, you know, as a result of this study and your inclusion of the da your data in this study um, are, are nil. It just won't happen, right? Whatever, whatever harm you're worried about, um, you know, it, if I compare not doing the study at all or doing the study with your data, the chances that the bad thing you're worried about happen to you in those two scenarios are identical or negligibly different, okay? So I might call this the no harm whatsoever definition of privacy. No harm whatsoever because, you know, compared to not doing the study at all, whatever harm you're worried about is not going to increase. And you can define whatever you consider to be the harm that you're worried about. Okay, so what I'm showing you on this slide is the cover page in the first of a very famous series of articles conducted by the British uh, physicians Dahl and Hill in the 1950s. Dahl and Hill were the um, um, Dahl and Hill were the British researchers who first firmly established a strong connection between smoking and lung cancer. And so, in 1950 or so. They asked every physician in the UK whether they would opt in to their studies, and two thirds of the doctors in the UK opted in. So they had a very large data set. Okay, and and so you know, not long after they got the data, you know, they did some basic correlations and found, wow, there's a high statistically significant correlation between smoking and lung cancer. And they started writing a series of articles like this one. Okay, so imagine you were. 
a position in the UK in 1950, and you were contemplating contributing to this study. Um, and let's say for the sake of argument that you were a smoker. And in 1950, probably you were a smoker because in the 1950s, almost everybody smoked, at least in westernized nations. It was not, there was no social or medical stigma associated with it. It was actually seen as glamorous. By the way, um, my parents met as graduate students at Berkeley and got married at International House. And one of the things they told me at some point was that, you know, smoking in the late 50s at Berkeley was rampant. And you would be in a lecture hall, like in LeConte Hall or something, in a physics lecture. And the, the entire room would be just a, like a cloud, a haze of smoke. You could barely see the blackboard if you weren't sitting close. And furthermore, the instructor would be chain smoking during the lecture, okay? So, so like smoking was no big deal in 1950. And so you might have been as well a smoker and you wouldn't have been hiding this fact. It would have been kind of public knowledge to people that knew you at least, okay? Okay, so now suppose you contributed your medical record to this study. Well, real harm could have come to you as a result of this study, right? Because, you know, now the world knows about this strong connection between smoking and lung cancer. People know that you're a smoker. So everybody's posterior belief that you might have lung cancer goes up, possibly including your health insurer who might decide to raise your premium. So we could literally say that actual financial harm resulted to you from your contribution of your medical record to the study. And so this no harm whatsoever definition would preclude valuable uses of data like this one. Okay, so that seems like it's going too far, but the, the two worlds that I compared in this definition actually contain the seed of like the escape hatch to you know, like what we and many, many others think is the right notion of privacy. And, and the observation is the following. In the no harm whatsoever definition, I considered two different worlds. I do the study with your medical record included, or I don't do the study at all, okay? But if you think about it, in the Dolan Hill study, it's not as if your medical record was the crucial piece of data that allowed them to discover the link between smoking and lung cancer. Like, any sufficiently large data set of smokers and non-smokers would have made this fact glaringly obvious to Dahl and Hill, okay? So the point is, is that the link between smoking and lung cancer isn't actually something about your private data. It is a fact about the world that can be discovered from any sufficiently large data set. And so we want a definition that somehow carves out these facts about the world and doesn't count them as like your private data even though, of course, collectively, we need enough people's private data to discover these facts about the world, okay? And so this leads to the now famous influential definition of differential privacy, which you can think of as just a slight but incredibly important variation on the no harm whatsoever. Rather than comparing, you know, doing the study with your data or not doing the study at all, we're gonna compare doing the study with your data and still doing the study, but just without only your data. So we're gonna compare two different databases as inputs to the study, one consisting of N medical records, including yours, and one with N minus one medical records where you are the minus one. And um, the high level idea behind differential privacy is that an algorithm obeys differential privacy. It's a property, by the way, of an algorithm, not of a data set, for instance. An algorithm is differentially private if a third party observer only looking at the output of the algorithm cannot reliably distinguish whether the input did or did not include your data in a statistical sense. Okay. And if you think about it, this is kind of the right definition because, you know, if we take it as an axiom, which we think we should, that if your data set wasn't, with your data wasn't even included in the input, then the output can't possibly violate your privacy. Well, if somebody can't tell the difference between whether your data was in the input or, or out or, or not, then still your privacy can't be violated, okay? And so when you look at the technical definition of differential privacy, which I won't give, you'll, you'll see that to meet differential privacy in an interesting way, um, importantly requires the use of randomization, 
Like the alg algorithms need to, in the way you achieve differential privacy is through the tasteful injection of noise into computations at particular points in the computation. And you basically ask that the distribution over outputs induced by that noise or randomization be controllably close. Um, and importantly, differential privacy does have a knob which lets you say how strong the promised individual privacy is. And there is always gonna be a trade-off between kind of the utility or the accuracy of the results you get and the amount of noise you add or the amount of privacy that you're promising. So to demystify this a little bit, let me give the earliest example of a differentially private algorithm or protocol, which interestingly predates the definition of differential privacy by about 40 years, okay? And this is a survey method from the social psychology literature known as randomized response, okay? So the idea of randomized response is, the, is to truthfully elicit from a population answers to a question that may have a socially stigmatizing answer, okay? So to put a modern twist on this, suppose I wanted to survey the population of Philadelphia, a large population, um, with the question, have you violated social distancing guidelines in the last six months? Okay. And we might imagine that if I asked this question straight up, right, that even if I sent people to anonymous website, they might worry that I'm tracking them. And since there's a, a potential social stigma with one of the possible answers, namely, um, yes, I have violated social distancing guidelines. If, if I just ask the question in a straightforward way, I might get a massive underreporting of yes answers. And so I would have sort of, a, you know, no way of really computing a good estimate of the fraction of Philadelphians that have violated social distancing guidelines. So what do you do in randomized response instead? Well, so in randomized response, what I ask you to do is I say like, look, um, the question is, have you violated social distancing guidelines? But the way I want you to respond is as follows. I want you to flip a coin, let's say a fair coin, 50% heads and tails. Um, if it comes up heads, I want you to just answer the question truthfully, yes or no, have you violated social distancing guidelines? On the other hand, if the coin comes up tails, then I want you to flip the coin again and just to use the outcome of the second coin flip to answer. So if, you know, if, you, if the coin comes up tails the first time, then you flip it again. If it comes up heads, you say, yes, I violated social distancing guidelines, regardless of whether you have or not. And if the second coin comes up tails, you say no, regardless of what your truth is, okay? So this protocol has a couple of very interesting, nice properties. First of all, forgetting even about the definition of differential privacy, it has a very strong sense of plausible deniability, right? Because even if I attribute your response to you, and let's say Peter, says to me, yes, I violated social distancing guidelines according to this protocol. I can confront him and say, are you crazy? You know, are you trying to kill us all? And Peter can say, oh, no, 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 no. I haven't really violated social distancing guidelines. It's just when I flipped the coin, it came, the first one came up tails and the second one came up heads, okay? So every single person that answers yes, simultaneously has plausible deniability for their yes answer. They can credibly say that their truth was the opposite. Okay, at, at an individual level. But if everybody follows this protocol faithfully, it's pretty easy to see that you can back out if you have a large population, a very accurate estimate of the true fraction of Philadelphians who have violated social distancing guidelines, okay? Because under the values of the model, of the, param the parameters that I've set here, you have a three quarters chance of answering whatever your truth is and a one quarter chance of answering the opposite. And so I can just write down a simple, you know, equation for what the, you know, kind of my maximum likelihood estimate of the true fraction of violators is, okay? And more generally, right, if instead of asking you to flip a fair coin, I ask you to use like a Dungeons and Dra Dra Dragon dice so I can generate more refined values for the probabilities, I could ask you to answer truthfully with probability P and to flip a fair coin to answer with probability one minus P. And of course, if I make the, the smaller and smaller I make P, the more I'm directing you to use a coin flip to answer, the more privacy you have, but the more noise there is in my estimate. Whereas if I make P 
bigger and bigger and I'm directing you to answer truthfully more often, you have a weaker privacy guarantee, but I have less noise and therefore a more accurate. And so this is the idea behind differential privacy. Differential privacy spent a good 10 years in the laboratory or more accurately on the whiteboard. And before, in the last five years, it started to see first kind of playful deployments in the tech industry and gradually more serious ones. So what I'm showing you here is a screenshot from a Google site that basically publishes differentially private heat maps of, um, of, of activity in metropolitan areas. So, you know, by heat map, I mean using GPS location data from Android phones. Um, Google compiles statistics on what parts of Philadelphia, for instance, people are gathering in uncomfortably large numbers in uncomfortably close proximity for uncomfortably long periods of time and publishing them. So in, just in case anybody who goes to those places maybe wants to rethink that, or if you don't go to those places, maybe you want to avoid them. Um, but they know, of course, that this is being built from very sensitive private granular data about geolocation. So they release these heat maps under the promise of differential privacy. And there are enough people in places like Philadelphia that they can still produce useful statistics while still giving strong pro uh, privacy promises. The real moonshot for differential privacy is coming up even as we speak. The 2020 US Census, which actually has a congressional mandate to um, obey privacy considerations in the release of statistics from the census. But up until the last 10 years, nobody had a good definition of what that meant. So all previous censuses used kind of ad hoc anonymous, anonymization techniques that were highly subject to you know, re-identification attacks. This year, they're promising that every single statistic released from the 2020 census will in fact um, be released in a differentially private manner with i.e. with noise added and this is not without drawbacks or controversy so here's a new york times op-ed kind of arguing that because of the noise added especially small communities might have an amount of noise added to their census counts which effectively disappears them or greatly underestimates their true population which is what you need to do in order to get privacy um, but since these counts are in fact used for federal budgeting decisions and allocations, this could have real potential harms um, to those communities. I, I should note that the authors of this op-ed are also demographers who, um, whose careers are basically based on the types of uh, census data that have been released in previous years. So they, they, they have a vested interest in perhaps differential privacy not being enforced in the 2020 census. Okay, um, so let me say a little bit about fairness. Um, so as I said at the outset, the study of algorithmic fairness is still very much a work in progress. Um, we, we already know that the study of algorithmic fairness will be messier than the study of privacy. So, you know, I've, I've argued here without proof, but you know, you can go read more yourself in our book or elsewhere about about why many people have gravitated towards differential privacy as kind of a monolithic single right definition of privacy. Um, we already know there's not gonna be such a thing in the case of algorithmic fairness. So in particular, um, in recent years, there have been a number of papers that essentially um, give what we might call like arrows and possibility theorems for fairness for those of you with an econ background. So these are papers that basically say, um, look, you know, why do we have so many definitions of fairness in the literature? Why don't we unify this into one stronger definition that gives us everything we want simultaneously? And so the paper says, well, let's take an axiomatic approach. You know, you, you know, here are three properties that you would want any good definition of fairness to meet, right? And you know, you, the reader, look at these three properties and you say, yes, yes, you know. Uh, the, I, these are incredibly weak properties. I would definitely want these three properties to hold and probably other ones as well. And then of course, the punchline of the paper is a theorem proving that except in trivial, unrealistic situations, you cannot simultaneously achieve those three properties, okay? So we already know that there might be incompatibilities between different notions of fairness. 
Um, and even within a given notion of fairness, there will be trade-offs between accuracy and fairness, just the way there are trade-offs between accuracy and privacy and differential privacy. And it can even be worse than that. It could really even be that with respect to a particular definition of fairness, like equalizing the error rates of a, of a model that I've learned across di different demographic groups, that asking for more equality by gender means that I have to have less equality by race. There, can, there really are data sets where that tension exists. And that's just like a fact of life or science that we have to get used to and we need as a society to, for, you know, to, to make difficult choices about these trade-offs. But before I get too far, let me just give you like a toy yet realistic example of how it is that sort of the, the vanilla standard classical principles of machine learning um, will, you should expect them to result in models that are unfair in, in, in ways that we can quantify, okay? Um, so, so let me give this example. So suppose Aaron and I were asked by the University of Pennsylvania admissions office to help them develop a predictive model from past admissions data on what high school applicants to Penn will succeed in college, okay? And just to make this simple and visual, let's imagine we're trying to predict collegiate success from only two variables, an applicant's high school grade point average on the x-axis and their SAT score on the y-axis, okay? And so each green point here has an x-coordinate representing that applicant's high school GPA and a y-coordinate representing their SAT score. And I'm imagining that what we're, the data set that we have here is not only on students that were admitted to Penn, but that actually matriculated, that came to Penn, okay? So because they were accepted and they attended Penn, we know whether they succeeded in hindsight. And for success, let's use any quantitative, objectively measurable definition that you like. Let's say um, graduated within five years of starting with at least a 3.0 GPA. And so the plus green points indicate the people who succeeded according to that criteria, the minus indicated the people who didn't succeed, okay? And even without knowing anything about machine learning, if I asked you to eyeball this cloud of data points and use it to build a predictive model that we could apply to future applicants of Penn, you might very well choose this blue um, linear classifier where we're going to predict that any point that's above this blue line is going to succeed and anybody below this blue line is not going to succeed. And you'll see that it does a pretty good job of separating pluses from minuses. It's not perfect. It makes some, it makes some false positives, right? These are the students who, actually, who would have been accepted by this model that in fact failed at Penn. And it makes some false rejections. These are students who did in fact succeed historically that this model would have rejected. But it, but it does a pretty good job. And if you looked carefully, you would see that this is the linear classifier, which minimizes the error on the historical data, okay? Which is, the, you know, to a first approximation is like the common criteria for machine learning. You have some training data set and you want to minimize the error on that training data set, okay? Well, suppose I told you that this cloud of points was not the entire data set, but that there was another subgroup of applicants that I'll call the oranges. And here are the orange data points. And there's a few things I want you to notice about the oranges. First of all, the oranges are a minority group in the literal sense that there are far fewer of them than there were of the green points. Secondly, there seems to be something different about the distribution of the orange points. In particular, their SAT scores seem to be systematically lower. The orange cloud just looks kind of shifted down compared to the green cloud, okay? And I might, I might offer a reason for that. Maybe the green applicants are from a wealthy demographic and that wealthy demographic has the time and the money to pay for SAT tutoring courses and multiple retakes of the exam, submitting the best scores to Penn. The orange population can't afford that. They are going to high school and working a job to support their family. So they just do a bit of self-study. They take the exam once and they if they take whatever scores they get. But despite their SAT scores being lower, it is not the case that the oranges are less qualified to succeed at Penn. If you had counted carefully in the green cloud, you would have found that slightly le less than half of the green cloud were, were pluses. 
whereas exactly half of the orange cloud are pluses. So the oranges appear to be slightly more qualified for success than the greens. And if I ask you to build a classifier just for the oranges, you might well pick this purple line, which actually does a perfect job on the data of separating pluses from minuses. So you can see where this is heading. The problem arises when I look at the combined cloud. And if I just use the standard time-honored principle of minimizing the error on the overall data set, I am unfortunately forced to choose the same classifier I would have on the green alone. And the reason is that if I try to move this blue classifier down far enough to pick up these five orange pluses, I will pick up so many more green minuses along the way that my overall error will increase significantly, okay? So we have a situation where the standard principle of machine learning will by definition lead us to a model with low error, but now we can also quantify the sense in which this model is unfair. If I, if, I, if I posit that the greatest harm that can occur in college admissions is false rejection rather than false acceptance, although I could argue that it's not great to be accepted to some place that you're not going to succeed, but if I really think as the main injustice or harm that I'm trying to prevent is false rejections, well, this model, which maximizes the overall predictive accuracy on the data, also is maximally unfair in the sense that the false rejection rate on the orange population is 100%, and the false rejection rate on the green population is close to zero, okay? Now you might say to me, well, this is silly. Why don't I, if, if I'm able to measure on the app, if I ask on the application, whether you're a green or an orange, why don't I just use this two-part model, which says, well, if you're from the green, I'm going to apply the blue model. And if you're from the orange, I'm going to apply the purple model, okay? And if I did that, not only would I erase the disparity in false rejection rates, I would also improve my overall accuracy. Unfortunately, once again, to the extent that we have laws that are precise about what fairness means, let's say in the United States, if, as I've suggested or invited you to believe that orange and um, green correlate or are, 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 are either are or strongly correlated with race, this type of two-part model is explicitly forbidden because it looks at race as an input. And for instance, in consumer lending in the United States, it is forbidden to use race as an input. And so this is an example where, you know, I'm, I'm sure that people who enacted these laws were well-intentioned, but it, it was again, kind of like anonymity. It was this magical thinking like, oh, Somehow, if I don't let you look at race in your modeling process, you can't possibly be unfair by race. So this example is a case where, in fact, forbidding the use of race as an input to the model ensures harm to the very group that you thought you were protecting by forbidding the use of race in the first place, okay? And so we argue in the book that definitions of fairness that try to get fairness by restricting the inputs to an algorithm or to a machine learning model are like k anonymity, fundamentally flawed and broken and unfortunately encoded in many bodies of law. Um, and that what you should do instead is use definitions of fairness that simply say what you want at the output, not at the input. So go ahead and use anything you want. Use race, use people's social media data to make lending decisions, but don't discriminate. Don't have models that have widely different false acceptance or rejection rates on different demographic groups that you care to protect, okay? But notice as a byproduct of this little vignette, we now do have a precise definition of fairness um, and, and many of the definitions of fairness that are in wide use have this form. What is that definition of fairness? Rather than the usual criteria of find the model, the linear classifier, the deep neural network, whatever you want, that minimizes the overall error on the data, solve, instead of that optimization problem, solve a constrained optimization problem. And that constrained optimization problem is minimize the overall error on the data subject to the condition that let's say the false rejection rate between these two groups has to be zero or less than 1% or less than 5% or less than 25% 
And so once again, as with differential privacy, I have a knob on this definition. If I set that knob to zero, then I'm prioritizing fairness over everything else, including predictive accuracy. If I let the disparity between false rejection rates be 5%, I'm still asking for you know, a strong notion of fairness of this type at least. But now I have some wiggle room to optimize the error. If I back off and let the disparity be 100%, then it's like I didn't ask for any fairness at all. And so you can go to actual data sets and implement algorithms that solve these types of constrained optimization problems. And you can plot out Pareto curves of this kind. So what am I showing you here? On some real data set in which fairness is a concern, on the x-axis, I'm showing you the error of the model on the overall data set. And on the y-axis, I'm showing you the unfairness of the model according to some measure like the difference between false rejection rates across racial groups, okay? And each little red dot on this curve is a different model. Think of it as being like a different linear classifier on the toy data set in the example that I just gave. And you can see, right, you have a clear trade-off here. You can either ignore fairness entirely and just go for minimizing error, in which case you'll get this model, which has the lowest error value, but the highest unfairness value. You can ask to turn that knob all the way to 0% disparity in false rejection rates and, and get to zero unfairness at considerably higher error. And in between, you can get, you'll get in between, okay? And so I'll make two comments about this. In, in some sense, this is kind of as far as the science can take us in the sense that like, you know, a computer scientist like me shouldn't be looking at a curve like this and telling the Penn admissions, like, a, this is what I should give to the Penn admissions office. I shouldn't give this to the Penn admissions office and say like, and this is the place you want to be on this curve, because that's like a, that's a qualitative decision. That's like a moral decision that a stakeholder who really thinks carefully about the balance between fairness and accuracy in college admissions or criminal sentencing or whatever it is should make. Okay. So that's sort of point one, number one. Point number two is that, you know, probably not too many people in this audience, but when we weighed out amongst other groups that can include regulators sometimes, they sometimes want to disavow figures like this at all. And they say like, oh, well, you know, I don't want to be anywhere on this picture at all. I find it distasteful to be asked to quantify my relative value for fairness versus accuracy. And, and our, you know, our answer to that is probably obvious to many of you, which is like, sure, you can be somewhere else other than on this curve. And where that somewhere else is going to be is over here somewhere, right? Because this is the Pareto frontier. This is the set of like undominated models in this two dimensional objective space of fairness and accuracy. And if you ignore it, you ignore it at your peril because you're likely to pick a model over here, which is one that can be improved on both fairness and accuracy by moving to a model that's on the, on the efficient frontier. Okay. So I'm running out of time. So let me just let me just say a little bit more about the second half of the book. So what I what I the things like what I've told you so far mainly occupy the first half of the book. The second half of the book takes what we think is an interesting left turn. And so so I won't go into much detail, but I'll tell you, you the nature of the left turn. I've invited you in everything I've said so far, and all of the books that I pointed to at the beginning also invite you to think this way, to think of ordinary people as being the victims of algorithms and models and machine learning. So, you know, somebody builds this big predictive model from our collective data, and now this model is making lending decisions, criminal sentencing decisions, call it admissions decisions, and inflicting, you know, measurable real harm on ordinary people. And even worse, these ordinary people might not even realize that this is happening. They may not know that they were rejected from a, for a loan by a neural network, for example. In the second half of the book, we think about situations in which algorithms are again, and often, you know, more specifically models that are the output of a machine learning process are central, but it's not quite so easy to entirely blame the algorithm because the algorithm or perhaps more accurately, the app is actually mediating the possibly competing preferences of a large population of users, okay? So just to give you a little bit of flavor of what I mean by that, you know, the most standard example would be um, the most standard example, the easiest example to think about are navigation apps like Google Maps and Waze. 
So on the one hand, what could possibly be better, right? Instead of like, you know, the old days of fold up maps and, you know, hourly traffic reports on the radio, I just punch in, I'm here, I want to go here, what's, you know, and in response to the real time GPS traffic data from like all of our phones, the app tells me, here's your shortest driving route, okay? And so like, this is great. I'll admit, I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't go anywhere you know, uh, that I don't know the way very well in the traffic patterns already without using these apps. But, but if you back up for a second, you know, what's really going on with these apps is that we, we are playing some incredibly complicated multiplayer game, right? It's, it's a game in the literal game theoretic sense in that each of us has a utility function, right? I want to go from here to there, and my objective is to minimize my driving time usually, okay? And all of you have similar utility functions, okay? And what these apps are doing is helping us compute our best responses. In response to what everybody else is doing, here's your best response. And so in that sense, these apps are nudging us towards a competitive equilibrium. Literally, they are nudging us towards a Nash equilibrium. And again, any of you who have ever been exposed to even a little bit of game theory will know that just because we're at an equilibrium of some kind doesn't mean, not, not only does it not mean that we're not collectively better off, it doesn't necessarily mean that any one of us individually is off, right? So tragedy of the commons um, or prisoner's dilemma are, are kind of good examples of this, okay? And so in the second half of the book, we, we sort of talk about situations and, and it, it includes things like recommendation systems and, and you know, filtering of your Facebook news feed and shopping recommendations and things like this. Um, we think about these settings where our collective data is being used to optimize or personalize something for us. And you know, what type of equilibrium it's driving us towards and whether we're happy or not with it. And, and again, in the spirit of the book and the research it describes, we talk about algorithmic solutions, like how might you how might you, for instance, modify navigation apps in a way that, for instance, still gives us kind of the benefits of them largely that we've come to know and love, but without sort of driving us towards equilibria that might be collectively causing us to spend more time commuting than we actually need to in some other non-equilibrium solution, okay? And that's sort of the subject of the second half of the book. Okay, so let me, um, let me stop there and um, leave plenty of time for Q&A, hopefully. Fantastic. Thanks, Michael. That was really fascinating and, and, and very, <clears throat> very accessible. So yes, we'll take, we'll take um, questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A feature, uh, type your questions into, into that. There's, there's already half a dozen there, uh, Michael. Of, about half of them seem to be on the privacy direction. Um, uh, so, so maybe I'll let me let me uh, read one out to you. So, the first one is: Do you think it would be ethical to set up an economic model where you offer rewards to people to incentivize them to make their data public? The idea is to let people choose if they want their data to be included in the data set and take the risk of losing their privacy. Okay, so that that's a great idea, um, and I think that that's a great idea that deserves research. We've tried to think about that a little bit a few years ago, um, and it quickly gets difficult, but also interesting. Um, and let me try to swap back in a couple of reasons why. Um, so so one, one thing that you immediately face um, is, you know, so, so I think if, if I understand the question correctly, it's like, you know, maybe differential privacy could be used um, or some other mechanism could be used to kind of decide what the fair price for people's individual data was um, with respect to like the, its contribution to a, to a computation. And, and so one, one kind of, I don't know if paradox is the right word, but one, one problem that immediately arises is that su suppose I'm trying to build a predictive model for a very rare disease, okay? So, you know, it's easy for me to get the medical records of people who don't have the rare disease because they don't have the rare, you know, there's a lot of them, first of all, and, you know, they don't have the rare disease. So there's nothing particular, at least with respect to this prediction, there's nothing particularly stigmatizing. 
But I also need to incentivize the people with the rare disease and a fair number of them, probably far out of proportion to their actual rate in the population at large, okay? So I need to figure out how to do that differential pri pricing. And of course, the people who have the rare disease who are the most valuable to this computation also probably have the greatest privacy concerns, right? So let's say the background rate of this disease is you know, one in 10,000, and I might want to create for machine learning purposes a balanced data set of 50-50 disease and non-disease, okay? And so then when you think about it, like, well, even if I could incentivize the people who have the rare disease to contribute despite the higher social risk for them, now that I've created this 50-50 balanced data set, if I just tell you, if I just tell you that somebody's data is in the data set, just from that fact, your posterior belief about them having the disease is, you know, many, many times greater than the background rate of the population. So even if you don't have the disease and you're in this 50-50 balanced data set, because it's 50-50 and the background rate is one in a million or one in 10,000 or whatever. And so we kind of got stuck thinking both from a differential privacy lens and more generally about how you handle these kinds of conundrums from a pricing perspective. But I, I do think that that idea of, of you know, using something like differential privacy as a basis for, for a market for private data is an interesting one um, and understudied. Great, the next one says, what if you were the tallest person in your city and the study gives the range of heights of participants uh, a range that doesn't include your height. So say you're six foot five inches and the range is four foot to six foot. Then say it make, makes conclusions that everyone who knows you will not apply to you. Can it still violate your privacy? Let's see. Um, I'm reading this. If you're the tallest person and the study gives the range. Um, I, I, I understand the purpose of the question, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make it precise in the language of differential privacy. I mean, um, if by the range four to six feet, you mean literally that's the min and the max, um, and, and people know that you're six five, I mean, the only thing that they could infer about you is that you were not contained in the data set, right? And so I don't, I think this is outside of the purview of differential privacy because differential privacy basically only demands that it be indistinguishable. Um, whether you were or weren't in the data set, which I guess I would be able to infer that you're not. I have to think about it. I, I don't immediately see that um, differential privacy provides protections in this case. Right. I mean, I guess I would see the question as saying, uh, can your vi privacy be violated by, um, you know, it being widely known that you are not a participant in some particular study or you're not present in a data set? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it, I don't think this violates differential privacy, but I don't, if, 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 if the, if, Alexi thinks that, you know, it should somehow provide privacy protections. I don't, I think it's outside of the scope of differential privacy. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and next one is also on the privacy theme. Isn't differential privacy pretty useless in medical applications in that the noise added overwhelms the data? Uh, okay, so, so, um, so good question. So in, in all of differential, like every differential privacy result, um, pretty much, has the following, at least if it's on like showing how to do some particular calculation in a differentially private fashion, has two parts, like a privacy guarantee and a utility guarantee. And the privacy guarantee basically says like, well, if you add this much noise to the computation, this is like the amount of differential privacy that each individual is promised. And then the utility part basically says, well, as a function of the amount of noise you added in part one, here is the utility guarantee. But basically the utility guarantee basically 
gets stronger and stronger, the larger the data set is, okay? And so in particular, a, a typical rate is, would be something like one over the square root of the number of rows in the data set, right? So in other words, um, if I have N medical records and I'm trying to build a predictive neural network for some disease based on these N medical records, um, the accuracy I'll get in my predictions will kind of scale like one over square. I mean, the, the error that I'll get in my predictions will scale with like one over square root of A. So, so it's not just that you have privacy guarantees, you have accuracy guarantees and a rate, which is, is nice as a function of the sample size. So, so I think the, the way I would put it is if you've got a big, big medical database, like a large hospital like Penn would have, um, you can actually do practical things with differential privacy while providing strong privacy guarantees, but you do need a reasonably sized population. And that's why the, that's the, why the deployments we're seeing are you know, on, you know, by companies like Google and Apple who have you know, huge numbers of users or entities like the US Census. So you know, I don't think differential privacy is a viable privacy solution if you've got a medical database of like 100 or even 1,000 records. I think you need something closer to 10,000. Yeah, so just picking out another, another question in the batch. Um, what, in your opinion, are the limitations of differential privacy? Yeah, okay, so I think, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so if you look at the literature on differential privacy, like the theory behind it is a very strong and beautiful and in many ways reminiscent of, you know, in an earlier era, the literature on public key cryptography, right? We have very strong algorithmic primitives. We have very strong privacy semantics and guarantees. We have, you know, very nice um, kind of algorithmic properties like composability. If I give you two differentially private algorithms, I can take the output of one and give it as the input to the other and that pipeline still obeys differential privacy. Um, so all this good stuff. I think the main difficulties with it are engineering difficulties. Okay, so in particular, the biggest engineering difficulty with differential privacy is you know, what goes by the name of the privacy budget. Okay, so let's take again a medical scenario where I want to use your medical record to build a neural network for some you know, disease prediction problem. Okay, and so I, I add a certain amount of noise to that computation and then you have a certain guarantee of differential privacy. If I now do another study, also including your medical record to predict something else, and I add noise to that, um, your privacy guarantee, you still have a privacy guarantee, but it's degraded. And it's basically degraded nicely in, in the sense that it's linear, right? So, you know, you have basically half as much private, you know, like you, the, you, you have, it, it's additive basically, okay? So the, the one practical problem with this is in settings where you don't know in advance how many computations I might want to perform on somebody's data, okay? And so in particular, one of the earliest commercial deployments of differential privacy was by Apple, who used it for, in, for the somewhat whimsical application. I think they were just trying to dip their toe in the water in a low stakes area, was to basically have your phone in a kind of randomized response manner, report noisy usage statistics of emojis. So like, you know, how many times this week did you use the, you know, the, the crying heart emoji? How many times did you use this or that emoji? Um, and, and so they were basically having people's iPhones report these noisy usage statistics in a differentially private manner, but they had to basically, you know, program the phone for how much noise it was going to add each time it did this. Okay. And, you know, when some, some serious specialists sort of looked at their implementation and kind of asked Apple like, well, you know, tell us more about the choices you made. You know, basically Apple answered, well, what we did is we just like, we basically pretended that every month, you know, we kind of flushed everything we knew about a user before and we just reset their privacy budget to zero, which you kind of can't do. So I think 
you know, in applications where there's going to be kind of ongoing continuous querying or analysis on some underlying data set, and you don't know in advance how many such computations you need or want to support, um, I don't think there are great engineering solutions to that. I mean, basically, you have two broad choices. You can either basically say like, okay, I'm going to allow queries up until some privacy budget limit, and then I'm going to cut everybody's access off. Or you can just start adding gradually more and more noise, which kind of has the same effect, right? Because once I'm adding so much noise that it's overwhelming, like the signal in the data, it's like I've taken away your access to the database. The one kind of holy grail of differential privacy that actually a bunch of us have been working on a lot experimentally that bypasses this problem is the idea of um, differentially private synthetic data generation. So the idea is I take an existing private database and rather than, you know, picking some computation I want to perform on it um, and then doing that, that computation in a differentially private fashion, what I do instead is I actually create a noisy synthetic version of this data set, okay, um, that promises a certain level of differential privacy. And then I release that to the world and everybody can do whatever they want on it forever. Okay, now the trick there is, uh, you know, when I sort of create this in noisy synthetic database, I have to commit to what statistics of the original data set I want to preserve, right? Because that's the nature of the optimization problem you're solving. You're basically going to say something like, look, I want you to find a synthetic data set, right, with like fake numbers in it that maintains certain statistical, approximately maintains certain statistical properties of the original, okay? Um, and then once you release that, anybody can do whatever they want to it forever. Because by the way, one of the other very nice algorithmic properties of differential privacy is differential privacy is, is irreversible. So in other words, um, if I do a differentially private computation, no amount of post-processing of the output of that computation, even combined with other data sets that be, might become available even in the future, can undo the differential privacy, right? So it's, it's, it's sort of like a data processing inequality kind of thing um, from information theory for those that are familiar with it. So, so the nice thing about differentially private synthetic data generation is you do once and for all this synthetic, you release once and for all this synthetic data set and people can do whatever they want to it. The, the problem is, is that, you know, which, which and, and this is the kind of thing we've been trying to work on, it's hard, is wouldn't it be nice if I could kind of preserve enough statistics of the original data set that all of the standard operations of machine learning would give you more or less the same results on the synthetic data set that they would have on the original data set, approximately. Okay, but it's not easy to sort of write down like a simple optimization problem that somehow captures preserve all of the standard operations of machine learning. And so the empirical question is whether if you just ask for kind of enough, but not too much, you might get for free on at least real data sets, the preservation of much more than you explicitly demand. And so these are kind of, but, but everything I'm saying here is very much um, a, you know, active frontier of current research. Great. Um, moving on to some of the, the fairness questions. Lev asks about the green-orange population example. Says it seems unconvincing with respect to race because if the explanatory variable for the difference is access to resources, or I guess, you know, more generally something correlated with the forbidden attribute, then using the this illegal attribute of race would not be needed to have a good classifier um, you know, what do, do you have a better example of this causing a problem? Um, so, so let me agree with the hypothesis, but basically say that the type of fairness definition that I'm talking about here, you know, is kind of inheriting the entire mantle of modern machine learning, which, you know, largely ignores causality. Right. So, so I agree here that, you know, in the example that I've given race is kind of a correlate of some underlying causal source that you'd like to address or adjust for. Um, and there are causal approaches to fairness. Um, you know, as you can imagine, 
causal approaches to fairness in machine learning are no easier than causal approaches to machine learning period, right? It only gets more complicated. And so there are such approaches. Um, and there's a lot of very recent research in this that I'll, I'll admit I'm not entirely up to speed on. So there might be advances that I don't know about. But, but the problem is, is just from an algorithmic standpoint compared to these more types of aggregate notions where you're just basically saying, look, these are the variables I can measure. I don't have access to the underlying causal explanation for the disparity in SAT scores across different racial groups, but I can measure race, right? And, and I'm just gonna try to correct as best I can. I agree it's flawed, but the, the causal alternative is, you know, is also kind of largely much less practical and actionable um, from an algorithmic perspective. All right, there's one here about um, uh, also about fairness. You said the, the social norm needs to be well-defined, uh, very precise to be used within the algorithm. Uh, say we take this norm to hire females given equal qualification, what would you need to implement that into an algorithm aside from deciding what equal means and what features should be looked at? Could you just repeat the last part again? Uh, what would you need to implement um, such a social norm, uh, so hiring females given equal qualification, uh, in an algorithm? Um, well, I mean, assuming you had some definition of what you meant by equal qualifications and you can measure gender, then conceptually it's straightforward, right? You would basically say, um, I want to find an algorithm, which, you know, I, I, again, part of the goal here is to create repeatable processes for designing algorithms, right? And so the repeatable process that you'd want to enact here is similar to the one I gave in this college admissions example, which is, you know, you basically say like, well, um, I'm going to first lay down a fairness consideration, right? Which is that, you know, pairs of individuals, one of whom are, is male or female, and that they have equal qualifications, the rate at which they're getting hired should be the same, okay? Um, now, in, in this particular case, this notion of equal qualifications, right, actually is a little bit different than the statistical notions that I mentioned, because in the statistical notions, like, you are not represented except as, as a member of your group, right? So just in case it wasn't clear, you know, if I'm doing consumer lending and I basically say, I want to make sure that my model doesn't falsely reject black people for loans at a much higher rate than it falsely rejects white people. Um, you know, if you are a black person who is actually falsely rejected for a loan by such a model, your comfort is supposed to be the knowledge that white people are being falsely rejected for loans at the same rate as black people. Okay but it's cold comfort for you. In this example of kind of equal hiring rates for equal qualifications, you need a little bit more nuanced of a definition that comes closer to the individual level, right? Because you wanna make pairwise comparisons. You wanna basically say, if I have two applicants and they're roughly the same except for their, their gender, then the chances of their being hired should be about the same. And there are individual fairness definitions in the literature, and some of them um, are kind of algorithmically tractable as well, um, but not all of them. So we'd, one would kind of need to get into the weeds a little bit on exactly what the features of applicants that you were going to use for determining kind of equal qualifications, and you'd need to kind of commit to some sort of metric for that. But, the, but these individual fairness notions have that metric note flavor to them. They basically say something like, look, um, if I'm going to make a prediction about two people um, and I have some notion of the distance between these two people in some similarity space, um, the, the typical type of individual fairness definition says, um, the, difference in, the difference in the way I treat these two individuals has to be less than sort of some function of the distance between those two individuals. So in other words, nearby or like individuals have to be treated similarly 
by my predictive model. And so it's a bit trickier than these group fairness definitions, but you can, in many cases, again, write these things down as um, you know, constrained optimization problems and think about solving them in various ways. Right. And, and um, another question, I guess, I guess um, follow on question about using um, uh, attributes of, of protected classes. Um, Taylor says, in focusing on the output instead of the input in regards to fairness, couldn't having inputs like race, gender, and sexuality being known from the beginning be harmful for people who are biased uh, against, I guess, be harmful because people are biased against those protected classes? Um, racism, homophobia, or other prejudice that exist. How do you protect that specific data being from being used in the wrong way? Yeah, so so it's a good point, right? So if if the reason right for excluding those types of protected attributes um, from let's say loan applications was because of an earlier era where you know you were worried that human beings who might be racist, for instance would look at that information and, and misuse it to make racist lending decisions. Um, you know, to the extent that that's still a possibility or that there might be other uses of this data that are outside of the sphere of building like a fair lending model, there might be good reasons to restrict access to that data. So I'm not making a blanket statement that you know, we should always willy nilly allow everything to be collected by big tech companies forever because we have fairness definitions that can prevent unwanted influences of those attributes at the output. I was, I was making the much more limited statement that if what I'm trying to do is, you know, direct a machine learning algorithm to build a model that um, doesn't discriminate by race in its decisions in some quantifiable way, that twofold, there is no harm in allowing the model to use those sensitive attributes as inputs because I'm explicitly policing the thing that I want at the output and I'm enforcing that constraint. And B, as, the, as for the example I gave, right, there really can be settings where I need that information in order to prevent the harm that I want to prevent. I, I would also note, note there, there, there are nuanced settings and these come up in regulatory areas as well. And um, and one thing that I'm still not clear on, despite asking several people that I think should know more than I do, because they're kind of in the regulatory industry, it's not clear to me whether in, let's say, consumer finance, it's clear that it's forbidden from using race as an input in any kind of lending decision, human or, or algorithmic. It's less clear to me what the restrictions are on lending companies gathering that information in the first place. I think they often do not, but but one thing I would point out that that having that data is often a prerequisite just to auditing your model for discrimination in the first place, right? Like if I have a model and not only does the model not look at race, but I don't have any data on race, then it's very difficult for me to determine whether my model is racially biased, right? Because the most obvious thing I would do is I would, you know, I would take a bunch of people from one race and a bunch of people from another race and try to see if there are statistical differences in the false rejection rates. And so you do see people trying to do proxies for that where, you know, unfortunately in the US zip code is a pretty strong proxy for race. Um, certain jurisdictions like voter rolls in North Carolina indicate race. So you can go, you know, if you've got enough customers in North Carolina, you can use vote, you can marry your data with voter rules in North Carolina. Um, but, but like, you know, I, I agree it's more nuanced about the different settings in which you may or may not want access to these sensitive attributes. Mm -hmm. So um, we're almost out of time, but just quickly there to, to paraphr paraphrase a few questions about interpretability. Um, what, what's difficult about formalizing interpretability? What are the distinctions between explainability and interpretability? Maybe tell yeah. us a little yeah, bit. So these are all good questions. So I think, and again, I'm gonna express, you know, kind of our subjective opinions on these topics. There's, there's, there's good work being done in these areas. The first, you know, the first thing that one needs to do is basically say like, well, what is it that we want an interpretation or an explanation of, 
right? And there's many distinct things we could want. We could want, you know, a, hang on one sec, let me get rid of this. We could, for instance, want an explanation of the data and where it came from in the first place. We might want an explanation of the algorithm that takes the data as input, like an explanation of back propagation. We might want not that, but an explanation of the model output by back propagation, or we might want an explanation or interpretation of a specific decision made. Okay. Um, and, you know, people have realized that it's important to make these distinctions. I think our view of what the greatest kind of missing research in these areas is behavioral, right? So in particular, like all of this, all of the kind of prevailing definitions of interpretability or explainability have a bit of a received wisdom quality to them, right? So in, like in the worst case, right? Um, sometimes you'll see people say like, oh, um, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what interpretable means. Interpretable means a, a linear model with sparse integer coefficients. Okay. So, you know, like I agree that's some notion of simplicity, but why should an ordinary person find that to be a satisfying definition of interpretability? And where is like the behavioral research demonstrating that some wide swath of society or even some small swath of educated society finds that to be a satisfying definition? So I, I really think that the words interpretability and explainability, they, 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 they invite you to think about the recipient of the explanation or the interpretation. And I think that good definitions need to account for like things like the level of numeracy. You know, so like how, if I was asked to explain, you know, back propagation in neural networks, to somebody you know that already has a firm grounding in you know statistics and linear regression, that's a relatively easy prop proposition. If I'm trying to explain it to somebody who didn't finish high school math, it's a very different proposition. And so I feel a little. I think we feel a little bit like people are you know kind of tossing definitions around without anybody te testing. Like, do real people find this to be a satisfying interpretation? Um, and you know. There are some, so some interesting ideas that I think are well-meaning, like, you know, Shapley values kind of, um, you know, taking an idea from the, you know, the core in game theory and applying that to the features in the training of a model. And, you know, but again, I think that that's kind of an effort at linearizing things. It's sort of like, well, if I had a linear regression model, I could just kind of look at the weights on the variables and that could give me some sense for which features were more or less important. But now I have this deep neural network, so I don't know how to do that. But there's this other experiment I could do. But even if I kind of accept that as a legitimate way of trying to linearize explanations, nobody's kind of said why the linearized ex explanation is satisfying in the first place. And so it feels like there's kind of missing behavioral research. Right, right. No, that's fascinating. Um, we're going to have to um, uh, stop it there. There are, there are many more really... Um, uh, fascinating questions and it's a, a really um, you know interesting discussion but we run out of time um, you've certainly given us a lot to to think about Michael thank you very much for that for that uh, talk and and thanks to the audience um, that was really um, uh, quite quite fascinating a great set of questions and we hope to see you all again soon thanks very much thanks everyone for coming in great questions <laughs>